Hi there, students. So today we're going to still talk about subatomic particles. Last lesson, we discussed about the positron, which was an antiparticle related to the electron. As we have discussed, particles and antiparticles, so matter and antimatter, they may join together and release a lot of energy. If they collide, they will annihilate. So all of their mass will be turned into energy. And we were able to calculate some of that by using the famous Einstein's equation, e equals mc squared. So the amount of energy which is generated will be proportional to the mass. And this relation will hold. Now, we were also introduced to these cloud chambers. And basically cloud chambers, they are some kind of a surface or container with a very super supersaturated liquid, usually alcohol, uh, with supersaturated water. So what that means, it's highly unstable. So you don't usually see anything here. And basically what happens is that when particles, subatomic particles, when they go through this, they will leave a trace if they have some, some charge. So we also apply some field. So usually we apply a field which is downwards and uniform magnetic field. And those charges, they will um, deflect depending on what their charge is. If this field is going inside, then they will deflect. If they are negative, they will deflect to the right. If they are positive, they will deflect to the left. And that's exactly how we got a, an evidence, a practical evidence for the existence of positron in 1932, which led to a Nobel of Physics a few years later in, if I'm not mistaken, 1936. Yeah, that's it. Anderson, right? Because of the discovery of the positron. So in this lesson, we will talk about some more particles. So we have discussed about the positron and now we will see some more cloud chamber pictures which will show us muons, pions, um, kaons, and neutrinos. So the muon, we use the letter mu for it. It's a negative particle. Um, and basically it was discovered in 1932, just with a positron and some other particles. Now the point of the muon is and some of the particles that we're going to see now is that they are highly unstable. So they have a very short life. So what do I mean by that? Well, they will exist, but only for a short time and they will become something else. So a very common uh, picture to show muons is remember that sometimes it doesn't matter what some of those things which are happening here are we will just say that it's an event, uh, especially because, as I told you in the last video, there are so many phenomena and so many particles that we will not even touch here, and you wouldn't even touch, or you might not, if you, even if you study like physics or engineering. So what happens here is that there's an event, and this one, I can tell you, it's a, it's a gamma particle. So it's a highly energetic gamma particle coming from that way. Again, this would not show up in our cloud chamber, so we wouldn't see anything. We would have to deduce that there's something coming. And how do we know that? Well, because there's something else here. And this is our muon. So basically, some gamma particle will interact, produce a muon and something else, which does not matter to us. What uh, what matters here is understanding the muon. And this muon, it does not exist for long. It has a very short life. So when it reaches a certain position here, it then will become something else. In this case, because of the direction of the curvature, as I told you before, the field is going inside. So the particles, they're going to twist to the right if they are negative. So in this case, electron is negative. So it's going to swirl to the right and also we would have some other particle here which we don't see in this case just like our gamma particles so we've got events here that don't they don't really matter to us 
what matters here is the mu1. So how did they actually notice, well, mu1, why is this not some other particle that we know, right? Because, well, it's negative. Well, if you notice not only the curvature, because the curvature of those particles will give you some idea about the charge, right? But also something about the mass, because the more mass, the longer it will take to deflect. But there is something else that we can realize in those cloud chambers, which is the thickness of the trace. So the mu one here, let's say that it leaves a trace which is thicker, and when the electron goes there, it's just not as thick. So there is some mass difference here, so we can say that this is more massive. And by measuring those things like the thickness and all the properties, we can come to a value, we can find a value. And what the scientists discovered in 1932 is that the mu1 was found to be lighter than the proton. So it's a particle which is not as massive as the proton because so far we know the proton which is quite massive we know the electron which is very 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 tiny compared to the proton and there's nothing in between you can either be very massive compare well it can either be like the same range of mass as the proton or the same mass of an electron like the, the positron however what they found was that the mu1 was lighter than the proton but it was heavier than the electron. So it's something in between. It's not as heavy as this one and it's not as light as that one. Also, because of the curvature, it was deduced to have a charge. And in this case, since it's twisting to the left, it's a negative charge. So just some fun information about the mu one. Its mass is 106 mega electron volts per c squared per speed of light squared and it has a spin which is some attribute that we will discuss later now also the mu1 is a category of sub subatomic particles that will categorize later on and are called leptons you might not have heard this word before but you know a lepton so far you well the electron is a lepton and the muon is also a lepton well the antiparticle of the electron the anti electron or the positron it's is also a lepton and the anti muon which would be mu plus is also a lepton but we will see those definitions later when we have seen all the particles that we are going to discuss. Now, just some interesting fact. The life of the muon here is in the order of 2 microseconds. So 2 micro, that's 10 to the power of negative 6 seconds. So this is really fast, really, really quick. 2 microseconds, same symbol. Um, but yeah, so it's something that happens for a very short time, so that's why it was so hard for us to measure. That's why we we don't see this particle and don't we, we don't talk about it oftenly just like we do with electrons and protons, which are far way more stable and live for much longer, uh, long enough for us to, to measure them to realize that they exist. Also, another fun fact is that the word lepton means light. And well, if you think about it, those particles are just really really light <laughs> uh, pun intended now if the mu one looks like something that only lasts for a very brief amount of time <laughs> let's discuss about the pion now so pion usually described by pi the symbol pi was discovered in 1947 and all those particles that we have been discussing before, they have been discovered using cloud chambers. So what happened for the discovery of pion is we have an event here, and it doesn't matter what it is, and they realized, okay, there is a positron going outside, there is some 
mu1 and look at the curvatures because I'm trying to keep those consistent, right? What is negative is bending to the left, what is positive is bending to the right. But also, there is some other particle, highly energetic, which seemed to spiral downwards. And then something else happened here, um, which includes uh, muons and, and electrons. But what's important here is this pion. This is our particle, um, and, and basically what's happening here is that this energy is becoming those three particles. There is some creation here. All of the masses, they will have to be conserved, so the energy which goes in has to be equal to the masses which are coming out. Also, charges will have to be constant, so all charges here, they have to be balanced. Now, comparing the life of pion, so pion, it will spiral in here, it will become something else. So the time that it took for this process to happen was about 29 nanoseconds. And if the other one looked small to you, this is basically 100 times smaller. It's 29 times 10 to the negative 9 seconds. That's really quick. So it takes about a thousand times less than the muon. Now, the mass of the pion is about 136 mega electron volts per c squared. And again, you don't have to memorize those numbers, but it's good for you to have a point of reference for you to compare how massive one is compared to the other one. So for example, um, the mass of our mu one was 106 mega electron volt per c squared. So we can see that this is a bit more massive than the mu one. Now, some other characteristics of this particle is that it has no spin. So different from the mu one, which had spin equals a half, this one has spin equals to zero. And also, there is some other property that we call flavors. And this one is, well, it, it's quite interesting to explain because it's a property that we don't have a physical meaning for. It's just how those particles behave. So we call those flavors. And pion comes in three flavors. So pion plus, pion minus, or pion zero. So this is pion, this is the anti-pion, And this last one is the neutral pion. So all of the characteristics, they're the same, same mass, same everything. However, no charge. Now, together with the pion, the kn was also discovered. And it's just written as K0 in 1947. Now, this time, it was the first, the first time in history where a particle was deduced by its decay components. So they did not actually see the K in itself because it's one of those things that we don't see in the cloud chamber. So we have to deduce that it's there. So let me show you what they actually came up with. So assume that this is a layer of some material here and the cloud chamber simply observed two particles coming outside one anti-pion and a pion. I know that they will have curvatures, I'm just too close for to see those curvatures. And well, that infers that there is some particle coming from above here, which loses energy and that energy is spread and creates mass. So that's how the kn was deduced. And it's fairly simple, there's not much to talk about it. Later, we will see that both kns and pions, they are in fact a kind of particle that we call mesons. And we do have some other kind of particle called baryons. And baryons are the ones that we know the most, in fact, protons, neutrons. And all of those are made up of quarks. So both baryons and mesons, they are built of quarks. The only difference being that proton and baryons, they carry three quarks and mesons, they carry two quarks. But that will be discussed in more detail further.
Now, the last of the particles which we're going to discuss in more detail is the neutrino. And the neutrino was only observed experimentally in 1956. So it was quite late if you compare it to the other particles. And that is why, because it's so hard to measure it. So to discuss neutrinos, let's go back to our beta decay. So beta decay consists of a neutron, which is naturally decaying into, into a proton. And to keep things consistent, there must be some charge being released, some negative charge and some energy because there will be some change in mass. Remember, when we are separating particles, which are bound together, there will be some release of energy. In this case, the quarks, so the fundamental particles here of our neutron, they are changing. And that's what causes this to become a proton. Now, we actually know the masses of some of those particles here. So the mass of the proton is known and it's given in your booklet. And you know that it's 938.3 mega electron volts per c squared. We also know the mass of the electron, which should be 0 0.5 mega electron volts per c squared. Also, we know the mass of the neutron. So mass of the neutron is 939.6 mega electron volts per c squared. So if we were to calculate how much energy was released, we could just apply Einstein's equation and find what is the difference in mass, right? The, so we find the mass defect and we get the equivalent of the energy associated with that. So if we calculate here, and I'm just going to use my calculator, the mass which is lost, it would give me 0 0.8 mega electron volts per c squared. So if I apply New Newton's equation, I would have some energy which is lost. I'm using the word lost here, but it's just released, right? It's dissipated, it goes into the atmosphere somewhere. So energy which is going to be released will be, well, we just drop the C here. If we multiply this by C squared, it's 0 0.8 mega electron volts. And everything would be fine, right? Unless we measured this practically and got a different result, which is exactly what happened. So in 1927, some scientists decide to measure the amount of energy which was released by radium. Now, in this particular case, it's interesting because when the process of decay happens, radium decays, um, one of the neutrons will decay into a proton, but that proton is going to be absorbed back um, by the radium, so it's going to become polonium. So after half-life, half of its, well, after one period of its half-life, half of that radium will have become polonium. And just for fun, this is about five days. So what scientists thought was, okay, what if I put some enclosure here? So I put all of this in some chamber, right? In some, I don't know. Um, in this case, they decided to use a calorimeter, which is smart. Why? Well, because if you put all of that inside of a calorimeter, you can just measure what's the energy being released. Right, if you keep this insulated enough um, to the all uh, boundaries here, if you keep the energy from going in or out, then the calorimeter will measure exactly how much energy is being released by this uh, reaction. So let's say that this is immersed in water. So all of the energy which is being released by beta decay, which will be the energy of those electrons which are being released since the protons are being reabsorbed and turning our substance into polonium. So the energy which is released by our radium, so the energy which is being, between quotes, lost, 
should be equal to the energy which is gained by the water. That's how a calorimeter works. So we can actually measure the gain of energy if this is a fluid. It could even be water, right? It's mc delta t. m here is the mass of water. C is the specific heat capacity, and delta T is the change in temperature. And this was measured to be about 0 0.36 mega electron volts per atom, which was very different to what was measured before, theoretically, to be 0 0.8 mega electron volts per atom. And this actually was a huge deal back then because they thought that, well, there's something wrong with the theory, we'll have to adjust it. And well, to be fair, that's how science works. But well, what were the consequences of, this, of these findings? So at first, Bo, yeah, the same one as the model, the chemical model of the atom, he thought that the conservation of energy did not hold for this case, which, well, that's what he could assume back then. I mean, it's some way of making this work. However, that, that was not right. In 1930, Pauli, the same one as Pauli diagrams, right? Wolfgang Pauli proposed that there should be a further particle which was carrying the energy and momentum away. And then, and he could Fermi, called it the little neutral one, which is neutrino, little neutral one. And he further developed Pauli's theory. So only 1956 were the neutrino experimentally found, experimentally observed. And then we could just calculate some of the, uh, well, estimates its mass, its spin, its speed. So neutrino, you use the letter nu, and the mass of the neutrino is 0 0.32 electron volts. Look at this number. Everything else that we have been dealing with so far has been in mega electron volts and this guy is electron volts so it's roughly millions of times smaller or smaller or even tens of millions hundreds of millions depending on which particle are we comparing it to so that's why it was so hard to observe also it has a spin of a half and its speed is very very close to the speed of light so we can assume that it's roughly the speed of light. Just to give you some more exact information, the mass of the neutrino is about one million times smaller than the mass of the electron, which is already one of the smallest particles that we know in the universe. So this guy is even smaller. And since it has no charge, that's why it was so hard to, to measure it. We could only observe this by verifying that difference in the equations that I showed you before, the difference in the practical results and the, th the theoretical ones. And by that difference, we could then expect that there should be another particle being shut off so we could keep momentum constant, right? Velocity times mass has to be going somewhere and also energy to be constant. So, whereas we were using cloud chambers in the beginning, those evolved in time and some more, let's say, technological way was to use hydrogen bubble chambers. And this was a new technique and it was a bit more, a bit easier or more precise for us to, to see some of the information from the chambers. But we used a hydrogen 
bubble chamber, especially in 1970, and specifically in 13 of November. I'm just giving some dates because it's fun if you want to read about it. Um, it's called the neutrino event, and that's when they observed a neutrino transforming into something else. So what was it? So the picture is slightly like this. This trace here that you cannot see, this dashed line, is the path of the neutrino. Remember that this is not seen on a cloud chamber or in a hydrogen bubble chamber. So what they observed is that a pion moved to the left here, deflected to the left. A proton was shot here also deflecting to the left and an anti-muon no actually just a muon anti-muon would be positive so what they observed here was oh there's this particle they couldn't see it right in the chamber it would be like that you would just see those traces but we can fill in the gaps with the knowledge that we have now so what they saw was okay there's this particle coming this way and they realized that it was hitting a proton. So this neutrino came all the way, almost speed of light, very low mass, but almost speed of light, and hit a proton. So that proton was set into motion. It was here stopped, and we can see its motion now. And the neutrino itself, because of the collision, the amount of energy which was released in this collision, it turned, it was converted into a pion, and a muon. So the collision was so powerful that the energy associated with this guy was, well, set this one into motion and also created two other particles. So neutrinos, they are amongst the most abundant particles in the universe. They are more than one million times more abundant than neutrons, protons, and electrons that make up planets, stars, and galaxies. Those are the guys that are just running through our bodies the most. The only thing is, they are so low, they have so low mass and no charge, so that's why they hardly interact with us at all. But when they do, you can observe it. It's just hard for you to take this snapshot.